look at the question of the origin of the first living cell. Back in 1953, when I was born, uh, this famous experiment was done in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, done by Stanley Miller, a graduate student with his supervising professor, uh, Harold Ure. And they uh, imagined what the early atmosphere of the earth was like, and they put the chemicals that they thought were in that atmosphere in some water and heated it and uh, <clears throat> simulated a lightning strike in the atmosphere to see what kinds of chemicals, uh, uh, compounds they could produce. And they produced a lot of tarry, worthless goo, but they did produce a few amino acids, which are the building blocks of life. A lot of people got really excited and thought they were just on the verge of creating life in the test tube, but they were, were not even close. Another thing they had in this uh, experiment was, that you can see at the bottom there, they had a trap. The reason they had this was because they knew that if they allowed the material that they created in the uh, spark to cycle back through the system, the same system that created those compounds would destroy them. So they had to have a trap. Of course, in the primordial ocean of the earth, there was no such trap. So that's kind of cheating. But uh, Stanley Miller has devoted the rest of his scientific career to studying the origin of life, and he has gotten nowhere near the solution. In fact, uh, Paul Davies, who is uh, at the Australian Center for Bio Astrobiology, makes this very telling statement on the origin of the first cell. He is a world-renowned scientist, and he says this, Nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves into the first living cell. Nobody knows. After 50 years of research, they haven't got a clue. Uh, just today, I read <clears throat> about uh, Harvard University's new origin of life research. They have committed to providing a million dollars a year for the next several years to establish an origins of life research center. And the newspaper report about that quoted one of the scientists at Harvard, he said, my expectation is that we will be able to reduce this to a very simple series of logical events that could have taken place with no divine intervention. The scientists have been working for 50 years, probably thousands of them. They've already spent hundreds of millions of dollars and they think they're going to find a solution that is a very simple series of logical steps. They have a lot more faith than I do. But, as uh, Paul Davies said, they haven't got a clue how lifeless chemicals evolved into the first living cell. So, right here at the beginning, the evolution tree of life is dead. If they can't get the first living cell from non-living matter, that's the end of the theory. But it fits the creation view that life was created by God supernaturally. But let's suppose just for a moment that somehow that first living cell came into existence by chance. We'll give the evolutionists the benefit of the doubt. Is the rest of the tree of evolution supported by the evidence? And to begin with, in the first part of this uh, lecture, we're going to look at the fossil record. Does the fossil record support the theory of evolution or the model of creation? Now, the Grand Canyon is one of the best places to see the fossil record, uh, 270 miles long, 4 to 18 miles wide, and a mile deep. And when you look at those layers, you can find, uh, just on the layers as they're exposed in the Colorado River Valley, uh, evidence of billions and billions of fossils buried in those layers. The evolutionists have uh, tried to recreate what that fossil record looked like. They call it the geological time scale or the geological column. And uh, they picture in this uh, time scale that very simple creatures, so-called, uh, came into existence first. They were down here in the bottom of the rock record. And then they diversified into fish and amphibians and reptiles and eventually into mammals and even into human beings. Now, you need to know that this geological column does not exist anywhere in the real world except in the textbooks and the magazine articles. You cannot drill down into the earth anywhere and find this nice, neat progression of fossils. In fact, we find marine fossils uh, all the way through the geological column. Now, there is a general order, uh, but it's not nearly as nice and tidy as this picture suggests. The evolutionists say that that represents the evolution of life over millions and millions of years. 
Now, to understand whether the fossil record supports the theory of evolution or not, we need to be very, very clear about the difference between evolution and creation because the evolutionists are notorious at confusing things. They will often say that evolution is change. Well, evolution is change, but it is a certain kind of change. I'm changing. I don't look exactly the same as I did when I graduated from high school. I have a few less hairs, a few more pounds in different places. But I can guarantee you one thing. I am not evolving. Uh, if anything, I'm devolving. I'm going downhill. I'm not going uphill to superhuman. So it's a certain kind of change that evolution has in mind. And I like to call it uh, vertical change. See, the evolutionists believe that the first living cell came into existence by chance and then it diversified over time by mutations and natural selection into the first fish. And then some of those fish gradually over millions of years evolved into the first amphibians. And then those amphibians evolved into reptiles. And some of the reptiles evolved into birds. Some of the reptiles evolved into mammals. And some of the mammals uh, evolved into people. So it's vertical variation from one kind to a completely different kind of creature. The creation model is very different. The creationists say that there is horizontal variation. God created the first single-celled creatures, different kinds of single-celled creatures. He built into their genetic information the potential for variety within their kind, but not the ability to change into some other kind of creature. He created the first kind of fish, uh, distinct, with the genetic potential for producing variety within that kind of fish, but not to change into a different kind of fish or to change into a non-fish. The same with amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, and people. God supernaturally created the first representative kinds with variety, uh, potential for variety. So the question is whether the fossil record and later, as we look at living things, support the idea of vertical change from one kind to another or simply horizontal change within the kind. Here's a chart from a magazine article in 1978 uh, in Scientific American. The whole issue that month was devoted to evolution. And in the chapter on mammal evolution, we had this chart. Uh, it shows the different kinds of mammals there at the top, kangaroo and anteater and rabbit and squirrel and gorilla and uh, whales and tigers and camels and horses, etc. The blue bars coming down are showing us how deep down in the fossil record those creatures appear. And then you'll notice that there are some blue dotted lines that connect these, some of these blue bars to creatures that they don't know what look like, some creatures that they have an idea, and then they're all, cre all connected to a common ancestor, which they don't have a name for or a picture of. <laughs> now, the question is, does the fossil record support the dotted blue lines? And I call as my expert witness on this question, Dr. Stephen Jay Gould. Until his death in 2002, he was probably America's most famous evolutionist. He was an atheist Jew, and he hated creationists, but he was one of the most honest evolutionists. He was a professor of geology and paleontology at Harvard, and he said this about the fossil record. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. I want you to notice two things in that statement. First of all, he tells us that we only have data at the tips and the nodes of the branches. We don't have fossil evidence, he says, for the branches themselves. And then he says, this fact is the trade secret of paleontology. In other words, either all the paleontologists know this and have kept it a secret from the rest of us in society, or only the elite paleontologists like Stephen Gould, who have access to the huge museums, know this, and the low-level junior college paleontologists don't know this. But it's a trade secret.